So even after 20 years, that stuff never gets any easier for me to look at. And I'm pretty sure that each of us that has lived through that event, that the saying is true, that we can all remember the place that we were at on the day that it happened. And I know that that is certainly true for myself. And one of the things that happened in the midst of that pain and that trauma of that event was that we as a country had to figure out a way to move forward, to be able to heal and, and to go forward from that event. And it wasn't always easy. But friends, I can tell you September 12th was a day that I will never forget. It was a day that like no other time before in my history, I had watched people come together and support their loved ones. I watched people flock to religious places of worship to find support and security. And quite honestly, friends, today I wish we would have a September 12th again, um, but that's probably a tangent and a sermon for another day. But friends, we are going to continue on in our series, Rugged Faith, and we're going to talk about this idea that to move into acceptance, to be able to heal and move forward, doesn't mean that we forget what has happened to us. You know, one of the, the slogans that we say every year around 9-11 is that we will not forget. Those people that we lost, those people that gave their lives will never be forgotten. And so, friends, I think in this day of, of half-baked wisdom, we hear sayings like, you know, we need to just forgive and forget. And I think that does an amazing injustice to all of us because we'll never forget. We'll never forget some of the most traumatic, painful times in our life. And how dare we ever forget that those people that we loved dearly. How could we ever forget them? And so friends, I want us to look at the, the very last chapter of the book of Job, chapter 42. Um, but I want us to be mindful as we read this. Because one of the beautiful things about this book is that there is a large amount of depth, especially within this last chapter. And friends, if we just read this last chapter with sort of this black and white focus, and we have a, what I'll call a really superficial reading, I think we miss something very important um, in the story. So friends, let me read to you um, the first six verses of chapter 42. It says, Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you will declare to me. I had heard of you by hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I despise myself. And I repent in dust, in ashes. So last week, if you guys just go to the next slide for me. I don't have the clicker here for some reason. But um, last week we looked at how God finally comes back into this story. And, and how I think, again, how his friends are forced to come and reckon with um, the things that they have said to their friend. And now we see Job entering into this. He has an encounter with God. And this encounter with God is beyond anything that he could fathom at this point in his life. And despite all of the questions, despite all of the anger and all of the pain that he has, the only thing that he can do is basically fall down on his knees in humility and say, you know what, God? You're beyond anything that I could comprehend. And everything that I thought important in comparison to you is just really not that important. Now, friends, in our, our culture, in our world today, um, it's hard to understand humility, right? We, we tend to use humility sometimes as a manipulation and an attention 
device, right? There are times that we will purposely downplay what we do in a hope that someone will give us attention and say, oh, I just didn't do very good at that and blah, blah, blah. And we hope people go, oh, no, you really did do really good at that and you're so great, blah, 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 blah. All right, so we do that to kind of manipulate. On the other hand, the other end of the spectrum, there are times that we self-deprecate ourselves, that we just put ourselves down thinking we're not worth anything, right? That we're just, we're not even to be desired in any way. But friends, humility or humbleness in the Bible is not either one of those. Rather, it's this idea that we cannot do things by ourselves. All right, that we cannot fulfill our own needs by ourselves and we therefore need to look to God to satisfy and to fulfill those needs. And that is exactly what happens to Job because he realizes that despite all of his best efforts, despite all of his best arguments, they pale in comparison to who God is and what God is capable of doing. And friends, Job's encounter with God also changes his perspective. He goes from what he says is this hearing perspective where he thinks he knows a lot about God, but when he actually encounters God, it just blows up his mind and he says, you know what? The way I look at you and the way that I understand you now, God, are totally different than before. And so friends, that's an important thing even in our own lives because I can stand up here all day and I can teach you all of the things that you need to know about God and to understand about the scriptures and everything else. But if it remains only head knowledge, you're going to be in for a rude awakening when you actually encounter God, right? And so one of the things that I will say is that when I went off to college, the church, I, I honestly believe, did the best job that they could to give me the knowledge I needed. but it And when I got to college, I had all this head knowledge, but that head knowledge didn't suffice, right? It just didn't stand up to the pressures that I was under, to some of the arguments that I found myself in. And it wasn't until I really started seeking God, working and moving into a relationship with God, that a lot of this stuff began to make sense. Okay, And so, friends, it's important that we are constantly seeking God because when we have those encounters, it changes us, right? The next thing that I want us to, to talk about is this idea that, um, well, let me put it this way. Rather than just reading what the text says, that, that Job has been changed, that he humbles himself, he repents of his sin, and he then changes his perspective of God, we also need to look at the unspoken. We need to read between the lines and see what is unspoken here. And I think it's rather unsettling because does God answer any of Job's questions? No, he doesn't. Job, God comes in and he says, who are you to do this? And can you measure up to God? Can you do this, this, this? in this or are you capable of understanding this but he says nothing about why this terrible stuff has happened to him despite all of job's pleas despite all of job's wanting an audience with god to just lay his case before god god just remains silent okay and friends for some of us that can be very unsettling especially when we're going through very difficult times because i think it's only human nature to want to know the why question why did this happen why did i lose my loved one why did god allow this to happen to me in my life and friends i'm becoming more and more convinced that the why questions while they might be important to us we might think they give us some semblance of peace of mind that they're not the best questions. And really, it's just like Job, when we encounter God in that moment, the why does not matter. Rather, it's that God will do what God needs to do to fill us up and to help us get through that situation. Because most of the time, the answer to the why question really doesn't help that much. Sure, it might give the reason for it, but it doesn't do anything to help us change what has happened in our lives. And so Job is forced to wrestle, I think, with this revelation, this fact that despite 
everything he has done before to plead his case to his friends, to argue with God, to want this, this audience before God, when it comes to it, he doesn't get any answers and he's left to wrestle with that. And friends, we too, most of us, will have to wrestle with that. The question is, will we be satisfied with not getting answers in there? Will we be willing to heal and move through those stages of grief or whatever we're going through to move to the other side? Now, the story lightens up a little bit in, in verse 10, and I'll just read you verses 10 through the rest of the, the story. And it says, So the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with him in his house, and they showed him sympathy and comfort him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning, and he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karenapuk. I butchered that one. In all of the land, there were no women as beautiful as Job's daughters, and the father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children four generations. And Job died old and full of days. Now, friends, I want us to pay close attention to verse 10 because I think it's one of the primary verses in this section, okay? So it says, And the Lord restored the fortune of Job's when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job as twice as much as he had before. Now again, like I said, if we do a really superficial reading of this, or we follow the tenets of the prosperity gospel, guess what? The ending of Job seems like a fairy tale, right? Oh, wow. You know, Job just persevered through his faith and God doubled him. Maybe I need to do that. Maybe I need to lose my family and all my possessions and just tell God I have faith so he doubles everything I had, right? Again, that's a very superficial understanding and reading of Job, and I don't think we would wish that upon ourselves or upon anyone. But what I want us to pay attention here is that in order for Job to receive restoration, Job needs to be restored in relationship first to God, which he did in those first few verses, that he humbled himself, he repented of his sin, which was self-righteousness, this idea that he was so uptight or so willing to argue his innocence that pride entered in and he, he sinned in terms of self-righteousness. And as he encounters God, he says, you know what, my own self-righteousness, my own pride and my innocence came before you and me, and so I repent of that sin. And then not only does Job need to restore the relationship between him and God, in order to be restored, he must also move in and minister to his friends. He has to restore the relationship with the four men that just berated him for 30 plus chapters in this book, telling him all of the things that he did wrong and how guilty he was. Now again, if these are his best friends, I imagine the relationships are in pretty dire straits right now. Because if my best friend, as much as I love him, sat there and ragged on me for 30 chapters about how bad of a person I was, I probably would have tell him to take a flying leap long before that. All right? And so it's important because God is relational, right? And the restoration of relationships is one of the primary features of our lives, both with God and with us. In fact, you might say this entire book that we hold dear is an, a love story about how God was willing to restore relationship with us, right? That even though man broke the relationship with God, we couldn't live up to the requirements because of our sin, that God found a way, created a plan that would restore us in relationship with him. And he continues to offer us forgiveness in love if we would just but come back to him, okay? And so it's really important that we understand how important the restoration of relationships is. And so friends, 
some of us might need to restore our relationship with God, right? There are a number of people that when bad things happen in their lives, they blame God. And I don't think that that's a bad thing, but there needs to be a restoration of that relationship. There are times that we hurt ourselves, right? And we need to forgive ourselves and store relationship with ourselves. And there are those times that we need to restore relationships with the people around us. And so I guess the question is, did they live happily ever after? I'm going to say, yes, we, it's obviously that we can see God's provision abundant and blessing upon Job's life. And yes, Job is able to move through the stages of grief. He's able to accept what has happened, but he will never, ever forget what has happened, right? And so oftentimes, I guess maybe because it's Halloween, it might be an interesting time to say that this story that we have here takes almost this haunting feel on it, that Job is forever changed by what has happened to him because he's never able to forget the family he had before, nor should he. He's never able to forget what life was like before all of this bad stuff happened. And friends, many of us cannot understand what it's like to go through something like this until we've actually had to live it ourselves. I mean, I can give you a goofy, uh, goofy example. How many people, <clears throat> before they had children, thought they knew how to be a parent? And if that was their kid crying in the grocery store, there's no way that was going to happen. Right? Well, until you have kids, you realize that that's not quite so easy to prevent, right? But now on a more serious note, I just co-officiated a funeral for friends of the family, for Carrie Ham, who was a pastor here up in Chatech yesterday. And her husband got up and painfully and emotionally said, you know what? I've just joined a club that no one wants to be a part of. And that being that he's lost his spouse and he's now joined a club of widows, right? And he said, I've got a hole in my heart that's so big. And he's like, I know if I just give it time, it'll heal. But it sure doesn't feel like it's going to heal right now. And he said, you know, somebody gave me some advice and they said, you know, Bert, you can accept this. You can get through it, but you don't have to insert your own expletive like it. And friends, until that happens to us, we cannot understand how much that is or what that person is going through and how much it's going to change. Because he will never forget her. If you've lost a loved one, you will never forget that loved one and nor should you. And so, friends, again, I get this feeling. I see Job just kind of sitting there as he examines all of the things that God has given him, and yet he's haunted by the things of the past because he's changed forever by the memory that he has of them. <coughs> Many of you know that The Lord of the Rings is one of my favorite books slash movies, and in that that book and in that movie, they do an excellent job of, I think, detailing this very same thing because after these, ad, these characters all go out on this adventure and they have to do all of the heroic things that they do, they come back to their little place, the Shire, and they find that because of their experience, they no longer fit in. Almost as if they're not even part of that world anymore. It's not that they don't love that world. It's not that they don't care for the people that are there. But their experience has changed them forever. And they can never look at the world or the people in the same way again. And it's a haunting, unnerving feeling. And so friends, again, it's important that we move forward. It's important that we heal. That we accept the circumstances and the situations that we have but we never have to forget. Now, I want to 
offer a word of, of caution because one of the things that I see sometimes, especially in people who lose things, but you could also say in people who have traumatic experiences is that <coughs> for a time, things are so in the forefront of their mind that that's all that they can see, right? And so if you lose a loved one for the first time as you're going through those stages of grief and trying to heal, all you can think about and see is that person. But friends, if you don't allow them to slowly pass back, you'll never be able to heal. And in fact, I would say people will ruin their lives if they keep the weight of that loss in front of them. You know, I've seen time and time again how two people can go through almost identical situations and one of them can heal because they're able to go through that process and the other one clings so tight to that that they can't let go that it ends up destroying their life. And so, friends, again, I haven't, I've lost grandparents. That's about been the most significant relational person that I have. And I miss them very much. I will never, ever forget them. But in order to heal, I've had to move them back here to the background. And whenever I do think of them, I honor them, and I think of the memories and things that we have. But I can't keep them here. Because to do that is just too painful. And so in order to heal, it's okay to move things backwards, to move beyond, but never forget. Now, friends, I want to take just a moment and talk about time and priorities, because this has really been on my heart lately. And as you can tell, I'm already semi-emotional here about this. But at this funeral the husband made everyone in the congregation promise that they, after this service, would go home and they would immediately hug and tell the people they love how much they meant. Because he said, you know what, guys? I never get to do that to my wife ever again. And so, friends, we have a limited amount of time We never know when our time will come. We never know when those special people's time will come. And so we need to be intentional about creating time to let those important people know how much we care about them. We need to do it with a sense of urgency. You know, just the other day, I told this story yesterday too. Kids and I are riding out to Jim Falls and Judah looks at me and he says, Oh, Dad, I can't wait till I'm 16 years old and get to drive. And on the one hand, my heart just, <laughs> my heart just smiled because I remember being there. I remember saying those very same things myself. And yet the weight of, of this funeral just made me think, How in the world do I teach him to value the time that he has? How do I teach him that he needs to just be a little kid? <laughs> and so friends, I'm going to ask you guys to do the very same thing. Don't take time for granted. We have a limited amount of it, and it goes fast. Despite what we think, especially when we're younger, it goes fast. And so tell those people that you care about how much you love them. Make the special time to be in relationship with people. And I would encourage you again to re-examine the priorities that you have in your life. Make sure they match what it is you say you believe and what you think is most important to you. Because one day we're going to stand before God and we're going to have to... To say, you know, I feel, I hope that I use the time that you gave me to the best of my ability. And I hope that we can do that without regret. And so friends, the other thing that I want to say that I think is very important, especially as we move into acceptance, is that we practice gratitude. That we're thankful, that we 
move out of this tunnel vision that we can have when we're in that pain and in that suffering, and that we can open up our vision to see the things that God is doing, both in our own lives and in the world around us. And friends, the more we do that, the more I think we will just be amazed at how much God is actually doing. So let me leave you with a couple of action steps this morning. The first one is to forgive. It's the key to healing and acceptance. And like I said, there are some of you that maybe need to ask forgiveness to God. There are some that need to forgive yourself for things that you've done or being too hard on yourself. And then there are people in your life that you need to seek forgiveness and ask for forgiveness, whether you've hurt them or they've hurt you. You've heard me say many times, when we don't ask for forgiveness, it's like drinking rat poison and expecting the other person to die. And I firmly believe that because in order to forgive means that you're willing to open your heart up in that moment and say, you know what, I'm willing to be vulnerable so that I can heal and get through this. And even if that person never ever reciprocates to you, it allows your heart to begin to heal because you're releasing that. Spend some time this week examining your priorities. You know what? What are those things that are most important? I have yet to hear anyone say at the end of their days, you know what, Josh? I sure wish I would have worked more hours. I sure wish I would have made more money and had more stuff. Not one person that I know has ever said that. And as we talked about that, we looked at that 9-11 tribute. I was brought to tears again because once those people realized they were in danger, what's the first thing they did? They called the people that they loved to tell them they loved them and they cared about them. And so do that too. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you to make sure that after this service you grab onto that person, whether it's a sibling, whether it's a spouse, whether it's your kids, and you just tell them how much they mean. And then, friends, practice gratitude. You'll be amazed at the change you will see in yourself as you begin to experience and encounter God in all of the different areas of this life. If you really want to take this one in depth, I have recommended Ann, Va Ann Voskamp's book, A Thousand Gifts, multiple times. And she'll tell you, you know what, just pull out a notebook and start to journal. Start to see all the little things that you're grateful for. And you'll be amazed at how many open up and how fast you'll be able to add to that list. And it changes you. So friends, I leave you with that today. God bless each and every one of you.